Thank you very much, uh, Karen, and uh, Your Royal Highness. Thank you for your very engaged and important uh, opening remarks. I think, think you set the tone for our work. I'm very glad to see uh, ministers here, important ministers for the whole COP process, and the SDG process, I would add also, from Peru and Morocco and others. And uh, I also want to say how Honored I am to be in this uh, hall with friends of water, as we all are, and to again speak at the uh, Stockholm World Water Week. Uh, and I must admit, it's good to be back in Sweden, uh, in particular on this internationally renowned occasion. Uh, I want to thank all those uh, behind this event for their outstanding dedication to this great cause. You are, through the World Water Week, mobilizing action on one of the most crucial challenges on the global agenda, safe water for all. Uh, the water issue has for long been close to my heart, and this will explain that my remarks today will be somewhat longer uh, than usual from my part. You were asking me to give a keynote address, and. I couldn't refrain from going a little bit deeper into the subject, so I hope you can bear with me. Uh, 24 years ago, <clears throat> I was uh, emergency relief coordinator of the UN, and I saw children in Somalia die in front of me out of uh, dehydration, dysentery, and diarrhea. Uh, for want of clean water and sanitation, many thousands of young lives ended prematurely. I tried at that time, I remember, to um, imagine the grief of their parents and their siblings. And I asked myself what the victims might have made of their lives had they had what all human beings should have, a healthy start in life, as the Crown Prince has just uh, mentioned. And I decided then and there to never stop fighting for the fundamental right for all to water and sanitation. I've done that both when I left government and was part of the creation of Water Aid. And by the way, we're glad to have you, Crown Princess, as a royal patron. Uh, and I've done it uh, in my different functions, the United Nations. And I will continue to follow uh, developments closely, even when I leave the United Nations uh, at the end of this year, together with Ban Ki-moon. Ever since my experience in Africa at that time, I've been growingly reminded that we can never take the precious resource of water for granted. A few months ago, during a visit to Vietnam, I saw farmers who had given up making a living on land, ravaged by the impact of drought, the salination of fresh water, and the erosion of shorelines by rising sea levels. I saw with my own eyes the effects of climate change. This is nothing coming in 40, 50 years. It's there now. And there are a few factors in the world today that I can think are more essential for our survival than water. We live in a time, as I guess we all feel, a time of, uh, and a world of dizzying change, of deep uncertainties, of grave risks. But I also want to introduce uh, the element of hope and that we should also remember that we live in a time of promising opportunities. Last year, UN member states made a breakthrough in our quest for a better life for all and for a return to a healthy planet. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Climate Agreement uh, adopted in New York and Paris, and very much thanks to some of people in the room today. Uh, these two documents uh, are groundbreaking. They are ambitious, and they are indeed transformational. And they have to be implemented. It's an existential issue that they are implemented. They are to be seen together reflecting the interdependent relationship between peace, development, and human rights. There is no peace without development, there is no development without peace, and none of the above. 
without respect for human rights. Three pillars. If one of these pillars is weak, whether it is an international system or at home, in member states, the whole system is weak. So we have to work on the, all three at the same time. And quite naturally, water figures prominently in everything we are trying to achieve in these three pillars of the UN. And indeed, by linking to water our work on peace, development, human rights, I want to suggest to you today the following words, the following concepts, guiding words, guiding concepts for my remarks today. I will try to speak about <clears throat> water, that water is peace. Secondly, that water is life. And thirdly, that water is dignity. Life, peace, life, dignity, peace, development, human rights, sort of a miniature of the global model applied to water. So peace, yes, because water is central to the security of communities and nations. Life, yes, because water is indispensable to development, indeed to our survival on Earth. Dignity, yes, because water is a human right, fundamental for justice and for rule of law. First, then, water is peace. In today's interconnected world, water availability is directly related to peace and security. Strains on water are rising in all regions today. Climate change, pollution, and growing demand for water are adding up to scarcity and ever greater risks. Only 2.5% of the water on the planet is fresh water. The rest is too salty to drink or to use for agriculture unless we resort to a very energy costly desalination. 70% of our fresh water is locked in ice caps and snow fields. And some of them are melting, as we know, very drastically. Almost all of the, all the rest is in the, in the ground. Less than 1% is available to us in rivers, lakes, clouds, uh, and aquifers. By 2050, the world population could rise to 9 billion. 9 billion people sharing a finite resource, water. There are several reasons why water can become a source of conflict. A major one is unequal distribution of water. One-third of the world's population already lives in countries with water stress. As the impact of climate change grows, so too will the prospects of further stress. And if we continue on our current path, the world may face a 40% shortfall in water availability in 2030 already. FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, projects that by 2025, 1.8 billion people will be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity. Two-thirds of the world population will be experiencing serious stress conditions in different forms. I have personally witnessed the implications of such stress in Sudan, where I mediated in the Darfur conflict 2007 and 8. Uh, I saw firsthand in Jebel Mara, northern Darfur, how water was being used as an instrument of war by local militias in the conflict. Cruelly enough, they threw dogs in the water wells to chase population away from their villages into the IDP camps. So this was a method of warfare, using water to force people to move. In Iraq recently, when I visited one and a half year ago, I learned how extremist groups, ISIS, exploit access to water to expand control or territory and threaten and subdue the population with managing and manipulating, rather, water resources. Today, more frequent and more intense periods of drought are de devastating communities in the Horn of Africa, Look at the El Nino effect right now, by the way. 
the Sahel, the drylands of East and Central Asia, and many other parts of the planet. Apart from causing hunger, droughts are driving people from the countryside to cities. It's a grave, great move now from countryside to cities. The urbanization is moving at rapid pace. We will have 60% of humanity living, living in urban areas only in five, 10 years. So um, we will also see increasing pressures on water, which in turn can turn to, and that's the point here on this part of the piece, can turn to instability, and in fact, conflict. A long period of drought and the consequences of the drought may, in fact, have been one, I would say, one of the factors behind the war in Syria. Droughts reduce agricultural production and lead to rising prices in the marketplace. When staple food prices rise, civil unrest can follow. We've seen food riots as a result of droughts and rising food prices. If you live on 1.5 dollar a day, you understand that rising food prices can be a question of drawing the line between life and death. And water easily becomes a source of conflict when this precious resource in, is inequality, inequality is, is, is so, so, so dangerous. When upstream users of cross-boundary rivers are seen to de deprive those downstream of their water, Disputes are almost inev inevitable. There are two or three very serious situations in the world right now, which carries with them the risk of conflict unless these issues are solved. One say, side may need energy, setting up dams, building dams, while the other side is worried about their agriculture. Still, and here I would move into the more positive side, it would be a mistake for us to get caught up in water war rhetoric. Water equally represents a source of cooperation, a source of growth, and a source of positive water dependence. And here's our challenge to make sure that we, and I look at the young people in this room, that we look at different methods of instead of automatically accepting that water scarcity could lead to conflicts and competition, well, let us think constructively of how instead it could lead to cooperation and mutual dependence, which is, of course, a factor of peace. When we examine history, we see that cooperation, in fact, on water is more common than conflict. Through water diplomacy, and some of us have coined the phrase hydro diplomacy, powerful signals can be sent on the benefits of cooperating around water resources. Water, if it is fairly shared, can indeed become a confidence-building measure so desperately needed in many of today's conflict areas. Three quarters of UN member states share rivers or lake basins with their neighbors. In the second half of the 20th century, more than 200 water treaties were successfully negotiated. The 1960 Indus Water Treaty between India and Pakistan survived three wars and has been instrumental in preventing water from becoming a reason for conflict in that very volatile area. Lake Titicaca has long been an arena of cooperation between Bolivia and Peru, we all know. I look at Ministry Polgar. Uh, and water use has been an area where cooperation has been possible between Israelis and uh, Jordanians. Uh, I would say a more equitable distribution of water between Palestinians and Israelis on the West Bank, for instance, would be an important confidence-building measure in that very tense situation that goes on for so long. In Europe, the Convention on the Protection and Use of Transboundary Watercourses and International Lakes has fostered collabor collaboration since 1992. And in Central Asia, the UN is collaborating closely with the International Fund for Saving the Aral Sea. As we work to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we must, in my view, capitalize on and expand these initiatives. Scarcity of resources, in particular water, should trigger us to find models of sharing and cooperation in the interest of peace and prosperity, as I just mentioned. Now, this brings me to my second point. Water is life. Water is essential to the viability of ecosystems and to the health and well-being of people. 
1.8 billion people worldwide drink contaminated water. 2.4 billion people lack improved sanitation. In poor countries, 90% of sewage is discharged untreated, untreated into rivers, lakes, and coastal areas. An estimated eight to 900 children, as the conference has said, under the age of five die every day from diarrheal, diarrheal diseases. Sustainable Development Goal 6 calls on us to ensure the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all by the year 2030. This is our challenge. Goal 6 and its targets must not be seen in isolation. They are part of a larger pattern. I look at the 2030 agenda like a ta ta tapestry, tapestry with many interlocking patterns and threads. One of those threads which is woven through the entire cloth of the SDGs is water. Water and sanitation are related to a number of development areas. Public health, food security, poverty reduction, economic growth, livable cities, sustainable energy, environmental health, and climate action. But the interdependence between the goals also creates challenges. As poverty declines, and as standards of living rise, as they should, people around the world, for instance, are changing their food habits. Most of the water we consume is embedded in the food we eat, from farm to table, a kilogram of wheat uses 1,500 liters of water. A kilo, kilogram of beef, 15,000 liters. I may say uh, off my remarks that this is a challenge for all of us, and I hope that the Swedish meatballs are not uh, threatened seriously. But indeed, we have to think about sustainable <laughs> consumption apart from sustainable production. Agriculture already accounts for 70% of the water we use. And the water that agriculture uses is presently not available for producing hydroenergy or for drinking and sanitation, although I got hope and I talked to our laureate, Dr. Rose, yesterday. Sustainable food production and agriculture practices are therefore of critical importance for sustainable water management. For water to continue to sustain life, we must work together in innovative ways. The Global Partnership for Sanitation and Water for All, SWA, is a good example of bringing people together across different sectors. And I'm glad Barbara Frost, the head of, uh, of uh, WaterAid UK or International, is here because I remember when that idea was born about five years ago. In the same vein, the United Nations is engaging the private sector, civil society, and the scientific community to support member states in implementing this very important 2030 agenda. And here the STD advocates, including Crown Princess Victoria and several other prominent international personalities will be playing an important mobilizing role in the next 14 years, I'm sure. As part of these efforts, the UN Secretary General and the President of the World Bank earlier this year established a high-level panel on water with the participation uh, of 10 heads of state. And they are now developing an important plan of action and I'm glad the panel, as Torgny said earlier, uh, are meeting here in Stockholm uh, under the chairmanship of the two co-chairs, Mauritius and Mexico. Uh, and this is very important work that we will follow very closely. And this is an initiative, as you may know, that comes both from the World Bank and the United Nations and its leadership. With networks such as uh, sustainable, uh, water, sustainable Water for All and our own umbrella organization, UN Water, as well as the high-level panel, and several very important business initiatives, I'm sure some of you are representing these here today, not least those who are related to UN Global Compact. These all are initiatives that can generate greater cooperation for the benefit of all. Now, this brings me to my third and final point. Water is dignity. The new sustainable development agenda must be a vehicle for efforts to achieve the rights to water and the rights to sanitation for all 
without any discrimination. When we call for no one to be left behind, as we do in the goals, it is not from a sense of charity. It is an acknowledgement of a duty. The right to water is a human right. It has been established both in the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly as late as two years ago. And let me give you some sense of realities to this. A child missing school to collect water is deprived of an essential right. So too is a girl denied an education because her school lacks toilets for girls, which is the case in many places. And let me state unequivocally, there is no dignity in illness and death from diarrhea. There is no dignity in open defecation. There is no dignity in paying outrageous prices for water in slum areas, forcing people to pay more for water than we do in our rich country. In today's world, limited natural resources must be managed more fairly. Climate change and growing demand are contributing to increased water scarcity. Yet, for food security for 9 billion people, we need more water resources and better water resources. We need more and better methods to provide improved sanitation. And we need to address equity among sectors of society and among people. Dear friends of water, we have huge tasks ahead of us, but we also have great tools in our hands for water availability and water equity, not least with the new SDGs. It's a great hope built into these goals. And the answer lies in practical things like better management, using what we have more wisely, more smartly, more responsibly. It means integrated management of watersheds and lake basins, it means improved irrigation technologies. It means less water intensive and more climate resilient crops. We cannot expect governments to do this alone. Guaranteeing water security for all will require the full engagement of all actors, including the private sector, civil society, and not least the scientific community. And I look at my wife, the former Deputy Minister of Education and Higher Learning, who has always reminded me of the power of science. So in closing, again, dear friends of water, let me make some very few personal remarks and connect to my introductory uh, comments. Throughout my life as a diplomat and a politician partly, and for the past five years as Deputy Secretary General, I have sought to place water issues where they belong, at the core of our attention and at the core of our work at the center of our attention, at the center of our work. Many people made jokes when I, at official meetings in New York four or five years ago, talked openly about toilets and open defecation. I saw the translators in the booth didn't quite know whether I'd said it from the floor. and couldn't translate uh, open defecation, by the way, <laughs> which is in itself a euphemism. But bringing these words and these challenges to the diplomatic dis discourse is, uh, to me, very essential. In fact, they bring the stark realities into our meeting rooms and into our lives. We now have a dedicated SDG for water and sanitation. Awareness has grown, not least thanks to so many of you here today. People are getting ever more engaged, and innovation is thriving. And again, I count on you for this. We still face daunting realities, but I believe we today are better placed than ever to keep children from dying needlessly. I've been haunted by what I saw in Somalia in 1992, yes, but I'm heartened and encouraged by what is happening today to keep children and others from meeting a similar fate. Again, many thanks to you. And let us be driven by hope and determination and not resignation and turning away from realities. Stop the world, I want to get off. Is that musical? And don't turn off the television. Look at the images straight in their face. 
Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and I have given water issues high priority during our terms of office. We count on you to carry this work forward. We count on your full support in the, to the next Secretary General in pursuing this historic, truly noble, I would say even sacred, even sacred mission and cause the right to water. Thank you. Please stay on, I have a question. Fantastic, thanks a lot, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. I think you tremendously captured the full Agenda 2030 in three words, peace, life, dignity. Who said that you and documents need to belong? Anyway, uh, now, with this community here, what is your take? What should the voter community do to get the Agenda 2030 to be a reality? Well, I, I think uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to translate these goals uh, to national and even local realities. Uh, the Crown Prince pointed to this fact that they are not to be seen in isolation in silos, the water silo, but they, they are indeed related to each other. Uh, I remember when I worked about the, with the MDG period, I said water, doing water and sanitation is right will have an effect on child mortality, maternal health, education, gender equality, and poverty. Five other goals of the eight were affected by that. So we have, we have to work through out with the horizontal method. And if you can use these 17 goals, bring them down to the clusters which they are, and see how they're interrelated, and organize yourself accordingly, on the national level, then this will work. If it's only a, something that has been decided in New York on the 25th of September, we have failed. It has to be translated, and that's why World Water Week is so important. That's why all the sectors that you represent in this room are so important. You will have to run with the baton for, to make this a reality on the ground and raise the awareness in all sectors of society and use the new methods of bringing this out to the people, the new social media, tweets and twi Twitters and Facebook, everything else to raise the awareness of this task because it is truly existential. And, but it's a great opportunity. I sometimes get very frustrated, I must admit, in my work because I have also the political sector under my responsibility, Syria, Libya, South Sudan, all the crisis. I see horrible human rights violations around the world. I see sexual abuse. So uh, it's not a very encouraging uh, environment, but I'll tell you what was happening last year to lay the foundation on development was historic. If you add up the meeting in Sendai on disaster risk reduction or resilience with the Addis Ababa meeting on financing for development, with the SDG decision in September and with the Paris Agreement in December, it's the best basis we have ever laid for a long-term wise development policy. And I think this we have to build on and uh, make sure that we don't fail all this work done. And I, must, I want to commend the member states who never you know, stooped down to become negotiators that went for the lowest common denominator. They kept a very amb high ambitious uh, level, and that's great, but of course it also raises expectations. But it can only be a reality if we translate this to the field, to the individual nations. And here I think Sweden has done a good job for also realizing that a rich country has obligations to live up to all these goals, but also that you organize it throughout society. And this goes for all members of the UN. I really hope that you will bring that message back home. Thanks a lot, Deputy Secretary Arnold.